Well, we finally did it. Eyebrow Cinema finally passed 100 videos. Oh, you broke it, Jerry. Why won't I die? To mark the occasion, I think it's time to finally do a rite of passage for film YouTubers. The David Fincher video. Fincher has come up here and there on the channel. He was a key figure in the film Bro is Dead, Fight Club popped up in Being John Malkovich and the Office movies of 1999, and I even did a whole video comparing The Curious Case of Benjamin Button to Forrest Gump. But I'm not talking about a thematic analysis or a supporting role in an essay on a larger topic. I'm talking a video essay that dwells on the man's craft. How David Fincher hijacks your eyes. David Fincher, and the other way is wrong. These videos are so prolific that it can be hard to find a niche. Video essayists have already covered how Fincher does special effects, how Fincher uses pop music, how Fincher shoots and doesn't shoot a scene, even how Fincher directs music videos. What else is there to talk about? Well, one thing we don't really talk about is how great Fincher is with actors. This is despite the fact that the performances in Fincher's movies are pretty consistently great. The man has directed seven actors to Oscar nominations, and there are at least a half dozen more performances I'd argue should have been in contention. Hell, the three leads of Zodiac alone would all have been worthy Oscar noms. Actors who work with Fincher also typically speak of him in rather high regard, complimenting how helpful he is in finding the character and cultivating a good work environment. Even Fincher's tendency for doing endless takes of the same scene, something you might assume would irritate most actors, is often a sight of praise. Some actors have expressed frustration, but many have also celebrated that Fincher provides so much time to work through a scene and really get the material right. I love the amount of time, the amount of takes, he'd let you go until you felt that you were happy, he was happy, you know, I loved it. With David, you have enough time to try it as many ways possible. And this praise goes both ways. Half of Fincher's commentary tracks are spent highlighting the details of the performances, complimenting everyone, from the big stars, to the character actors, to even the cats in Gone Girl and the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. This strong repertoire with actors goes all the way back to his first feature. Alien 3 was famously a hellish production, the young director battling both studio executives and much of the crew on a daily basis. The one group that had Fincher's back was the cast, for even in making a monster movie, and even with Studio Brass breathing down his neck, Fincher still took time to prioritize the performances and the humanity of the characters. David Fincher is a genius, basically, for whom I would jump off London Bridge. I trust him implicitly. And yet, David Fincher, actor's director, is not the typical perception of the auteur. The focus is usually on his slick editing and cinematography, or moody scores, or gripping set pieces. This is in part a byproduct of how assured the formal elements in Fincher's work are, but it's also due to how we think of actors' directors in the first place, and how Fincher clashes with that perception. For one, Fincher doesn't make actor-driven movies. As the man himself puts it, I don't think there's anybody in the world has more respect for actors than I do. I mean, I think they're incredibly valuable at helping you tell a story. But actors don't tell a story. Actors aren't the story. The character is not the story. The character is one of the people in the story. The engine driving his films is usually found in the plots. Whether it be the investigation of a serial killer, the creation of a website, the investigation of a serial killer, a mysterious game, a botched home invasion, and even the investigation of a serial killer. That's not to say these movies aren't populated by interesting people, or that the performances are lacking, just that they aren't the usual showcase for actors. Even the exceptions to the rule end up not really being exceptions to the rule. 
Biopics tend to be the bread and butter for actors to flex their chops. But Mank keeps its focus specifically on the writing of Citizen Kane, with even the deviations informing that specific plotline. Ditto for The Social Network, arguably a biopic of Mark Zuckerberg, but really concerned with a specific story within Mark's life which motivates the action of the plot. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button is the least plot-heavy of Fincher's work and more about the birth-to-death experiences of the titular character, but I wouldn't really call it an actor's movie either. Benjamin is a rather static character for most of the movie, and the performance is a composite of Brad Pitt, multiple body actors, and extensive digital effects. No one of these performers carry the show alone. What's more, Fincher's style of directing is antithetical to the expectations of actors' directors. We tend to credit actors' directors for their ability to work intimately with the performer, co-developing the psychological motivations and interiority of a character, providing context for an actor to dig deep within themselves and find the person they are playing. And that's not what Fincher does. Fincher's on-set direction is less concerned with intimacy with the actor than it is getting the scene right. The focus is on the exteriors. How dialogue is delivered, how a scene is blocked, how an actor looks, the gestures and facial tics of a performer. These are the details the director fixates on when discussing performances in his movies. Finding the character doesn't happen on the set, it happens in the casting. Fincher's approach to actors draws more from Alfred Hitchcock than Elia Kazan, where hiring the person with the right physicality and presence is key for unlocking the character. Actors are not tabula rasas that the audience can project anything onto, but bring with them existing energies and preconceptions, born from their other roles and their own innate qualities as people. Fincher discusses this at length in his commentary for Panic Room. I think casting's a big part of the job in that there are certain tangible things that an actor as a human brings to a role. I think that Forrest would have a hard time playing somebody who is evil. He genuinely doesn't have that. Jodie Foster can play a lot of things. Stupid ain't one of them. Cast roles according to the strengths of the actor. Need a middle-aged rich guy who exudes wealth to be a sleaze, yet charismatic enough that the audience will still root for him? Call Michael Douglas. Trying to demystify the super cop image of a real-life police officer and capture a warmer, quieter sense of decency? Get Mark Ruffalo. The guy is really good at playing a humble, yet dignified everyman. Lead of your movie is defined by the ever-shifting perception of a fickle public. Ben Affleck's entire career has been marked by massive pendulum shifts between being so loved and widely hated. Would someone being extremely handsome accentuate an act of violence? That's literally the only reason to have Jared Leto in any movie. Fincher's filmography is in fact a window to a time when directors actually knew how to use Leto, not as the star of a franchise film or in some effort at prestige, but as a pretty face to be abjectly brutalized. Let's pour one out for the golden age of Jared Leto films. That's not to say Fincher is simply typecasting, or that his actors are just repeating the same things they've done elsewhere. Seven certainly utilizes Morgan Freeman's well-established wisdom and gravitas, but there's also a world weariness and cynicism that distinguishes Somerset from Hope Colburn or Red Redding. Daniel Craig's Mikkel Blomkvist draws on a lot of the same characteristics as his James Bond, sexy ladies' man with an undercurrent of sensitivity. 
but the execution is far shabbier and more ramshackled than the ultra-cool 007. There is space for iteration, but the roles fall well within the actor's wheelhouse. Fincher is so good at this, in fact, that the working title for this video was actually David Fincher, Mastercaster, but then I realized that made him sound too much like a wizard. The strength in casting is most evident in the social network. Every actor perfectly selected to use their skill sets in a new context. Jesse Eisenberg had to that point built his career around nebbish, socially awkward characters, but Fincher tapped into the dark side of that persona for a far more damning take on the cinematic nerd. Counterpointing Eisenberg's coldness is Andrew Garfield, specifically cast for his open-heartedness that could provide the emotional bedrock of the story. And then there's the performer who brought in the most pre-established context, Justin Timberlake, already an absurdly famous pop star. Fincher has never shied away from casting musicians in his movies, perhaps informed by his time directing pop idols in music videos. And I cannot think of anyone more perfect for Sean Parker than Timberlake. This is a guy who needs to walk into a room with enough rock star swagger to completely entrance Zuckerberg, yet also be enough of a weenie to be thoroughly embarrassed by film's end. Who better than Timberlake? Certainly a star, but someone whose boy band good looks and smoothness could never be mistaken for tough. Maybe it's a hot take? But I don't think anyone in the social network's ensemble has done better work since. In the immediate aftermath, directors tried to position Army Hammer as a leading man-style movie star. That made sense on paper, given his chiseled good looks, but in practice, the guy just worked much better as a pompous bully than a gallant hero. Timberlake has transitioned more fully into being a full-time actor rather than a musician who sometimes acts, but no subsequent part has taken the same advantage of his unique mix of star power and dorkiness. Brenda Song should have become a megastar for her performance as Christy. She gets so much out of the line. You're asking me to believe that the CFO of Facebook doesn't know how to change his relationship status on Facebook? But her filmography post-social network is dominated by direct-to-video movies, including an original film for something called Amazon Freebie? If you've watched an Amazon Freebie original, please sound off in the comments. Garfield has had the most subsequent success of the main cast in both franchise fare and prestige movies but his earnestness has never been as endearing or as heartbreaking as it was for Eduardo. That's not to say these actors haven't done good work before and after The Social Network, but I also believe Fincher got the best out of them. Perhaps that's why Fincher is reticent to reuse actors. Unlike his peers, Fincher doesn't really keep a stock company of actors. The people who do show up in multiple Fincher films largely do so in smaller, character actor parts rather than in major roles. In fact, the actor who has appeared in the most Fincher films is Richmond Arquette, with five, often unnamed and always appearing briefly. Runner-ups in the most Fincher appearances list are Bob Stevenson and Christopher John Fields, with four appearances of similar smallness. The most memorable of any of these roles being Stevenson's turn as airport security officer in Fight Club. In the event of a dildo, we have to use the indefinite article, a dildo, never your dildo. I don't own Major roles, however, tend to be played by actors who only collaborate with Fincher once, and that is consistent with Fincher's casting ethos. Big stars embody a certain character so fully and completely that to reuse them would be redundant. With one big exception. Gentlemen, welcome to Fight Club. If there is a Bobby De Niro to Fincher's Martin Scorsese, it is most certainly Brad Pitt. Pitt has headlined three of Fincher's movies, and three seminal Fincher movies at that. The director's breakthrough, 
his cult classic, and his first prestige triumph. And yet, fruitful though their collaborations have been, I'm not sure Fincher's use of Pitt is entirely rooted in his depths or range as an actor. Pitt is rather clearly the weak half of Seven's buddy cop dynamic, and his line deliveries in the climax are odd and not totally convincing. Oh god! Oh god! The volume of labor for Benjamin Button is certainly impressive, but the character is more an observer for the ensemble rather than a multifaceted personality in and of himself. Despite having the titular role, Kate Blanchett actually has the far showier part. The most captivating Pitt Fincher collaboration, by far, is Tyler Durden, in no small part because it's the role which most fully utilizes Pitt's movie stardom as an idealized masculine fantasy, something which becomes more warped and distorted as the movie goes on. Call me cynical, but I suspect the pair's partnership is rooted more in how mutually beneficial it is than just Pitt's qualities as an actor. Fincher has spent his whole career at the intersection of art and commerce, a visionary filmmaker who requires the resources of Hollywood production to execute that vision. Consequently, the man must constantly toe the line between personal expression and commercial viability. Brad Pitt not only provides a marketable name to bolster Fincher's riskier films, he is also a powerful ally in fighting for Fincher's artistry. This goes back to their first collaboration, where Pitt was adamant that Seven's grim ending would not be changed, even as studio heads pondered if a happier conclusion would sell better. And from Pitt's perspective, Fincher provides more challenging and compelling material. The logline on Pitt, so frequently invoked that it's become a cliché, is that he is a character actor trapped in a movie star's body. That for all Pitt's matinee idol looks, the man does his best work when playing weirder, more offbeat characters. Partnership with Fincher allows for more interesting parts. There is, of course, one other exception to Fincher's usual casting ethos. Someone who had a small part in one Fincher movie, only to give a totally different lead performance in another just one year later. Rooney Mara is the ultimate anomaly in Fincher's filmography, the only of his lead actors other than Pitt to appear in multiple Fincher movies and the most radical transformation any actor has ever done for Fincher. The chasm between Erica Albright and Lisbeth Salander is so vast, and not merely because of the obvious surface differences in style and presentation. Erica is assertive, well-spoken, social, and warm, all qualities antithetical to Lisbeth, the socially awkward, uncommunicative, and untrusting loner. Where Erica feels poised and assured, Lisbeth is guarded and withdrawn. Where Erica cuts an opponent down to size with words, Lisbeth beats them down. It's hard to believe one woman could play both characters so fully. And indeed, Fincher didn't believe it. Like Catherine Ross in The Graduate is how Fincher conceptualized Erica and so fully bought into that persona in Mara that he was initially resistant to casting her in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. It was Cian Schaffen, Fincher's producer and wife, and Lorraine Mayfield, Fincher's longtime casting director, who suggested Mara for Lisbeth. Fincher only convinced, after a killer audition, his confidence bolstered still by a series of screen tests. Despite his own preconceived notions about what Rooney Mara could do, Fincher still allowed himself to be proven wrong. So, this November, when you're watching The Killer, most likely enamored by its precise visual style, chilling score, and meticulously constructed set pieces, spare a thought for the actors. Easy to underappreciate in the face of Fincher's craft and technical prowess, but the essential backbone of his artistry. 
Also, I couldn't really find a place for this in the video, but Nicholas's father in the game is played by Charles Martinet, aka the voice of Mario. Here we go!